ہوزبلاہتانجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم لسنرز پلیز نوٹ دیٹ دس از دا اسٹارٹ آف اے سیریز آف شارٹ لیکچرز آن دا بک حقیقت الوحی بائی دا پرومس مسایا علیہ السلام آئی ایڈوائز دا لسنرز ٹو ٹیک نوٹس اینڈ اینڈ آلسو ٹو میک ٹو ریکارڈ ریفرنسز فار فردر کنسلٹیشن آئی ایم گوئن ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ اے ویری کمپریہنسو اینڈ لانگ بک ریٹن اینڈ پبلشڈ بائی مرزا غلام احمد دا پرومس مسایا علیہ السلام بک از کورڈ حقیقت الوحی او فلاسفی آف ڈیوائن ریولیشن پبلشڈ ان This is about when and how and to whom God speaks and sometimes reveals knowledge of the future. People often do not believe in the signs revealed to prophets and other highly pious persons by God because they think they personally have no experience of such communications of unseen matters. So they think it's only made up or forged by the people. However, in this book, Promised Messiah al-Islam explains at length how many people, even impious, irreligious and sinful persons, sometimes experience similar things through dreams and visions. So they should accept the more detailed prophecies set out by him, alayhi salam, in his claim to prophethood. This book is nearly 1,000 pages long in the English translation. And the Promised Messiah says it should be read at least once by every Ahmadi. My lectures are not a substitute for you reading the book yourself, which everyone should read at least, in my humble opinion, up to page 538 in the English translation. In order to get a flavor of the basic philosophy and detail within it, the rest of the book is also important, but it is additional, supplementary, and with a lot more evidence in support of the arguments and signs set out by the Promised Messiah al-Islam within the main body of the book. So you must at least read some of the book in the English translation or in Urdu if you can. Now I turn to the introduction in the book itself. The book in effect sets out to prove that Islam is a living and true religion. Although there are other religions and nations claiming to believe in the one God, they cannot present any categorical clear proof of the existence of God, so their followers are left dissatisfied about the very existence of God, and many become atheists because of this. Now I present a quote from the English translation from page 2. Quote, It should be borne in mind that human beings can never recognize God who is absolutely hidden merely through their own faculties until he reveals his being through his signs. A true relationship with God the Exalted can never develop unless that relationship is created exclusively through the instrumentation of God. Carnal temptations cannot be removed from the soul until a light from the omnipotent God enters the heart. Behold, I present first-hand testimony that such, rela- that such relationship can only be possible through following the Holy Qur'an. The other scriptures are now devoid 
of the Spirit of Life. There is now only one book under the canopy of the heavens that reveals the countenance of that true beloved, that is, the Holy Quran. End of quote. Next, the Promised Messiah mentions that his claims were rejected by people, often calling him names like the Jal, meaning the Antichrist. To overcome these deniers, the Promised Messiah says that whosoever had entered into a mubaila or prayer duel with him lost and fell prey to his own curse. Whosoever initiated a court case against him was himself defeated. Such instances are graphically set out in this book in substantial detail. Promise Messiah Islam says, quote, Why did God save me in every single confrontation? Does this not prove to be a miracle? in my favour. End of quote. Now I proceed to the substance of the book from the English translation. The book starts by posing the concept that most people are not aware that a dream or revelation can be reliable. Although there is the danger it may be the words of Satan or the speaking of the self or ego, like wishful thinking, and not the speech of the Lord God. Satan is man's enemy, out to destroy him or her by diverse means. Even a satanic dream might contain the truth in order to snatch one's faith. However, those who attain a degree of perfection in sincerity, fidelity and love of God, cannot be overpowered by Satan in this way. See Holy Quran, chapter 15, verse 43. Sadly, many people are in the grip of Satan and they trust their dreams and revelations and then present them as evidence of their scorn of Islam. Or to say prophets were no better than other people and that true dreams or revelations are not the reason for belief in a faith and some present their own dreams for boasting and self-glorification and make themselves into imams, spiritual leaders or messengers. Such are the evils in society and this book is designed to make people distinguish the truth from falsehood. Now, the main philosophy part of the book, which is at the beginning, is divided into four short sub-chapters. Although they're not called chapters in the book, they're simply called chapters. Sub-chapter one deals with those people who occasionally experience true dreams or revelations, but who do not have the least relationship with God. Subchapter 2 relates to those who sometimes experience true dreams or revelations, but do have some sort of relationship with God. Sub, subchapter 3 relates to those who receive revelations from God in its purest and most perfect form and are honoured with divine communion and discourse in all its perfection. Subchapter 4 relates to the Promised Messiah, Salam's own personal experiences and to explain which of the three categories Promised Messiah, Salam himself himself falls into and why. Now I will start to deal with these four subchapters methodically in these lectures. Subchapter 1 deals with the experiences of those people who have no relationship whatsoever 
with Allah and do not receive even a little of the light given to his chosen servants and their carnal self is very far from any divine light. Since man was actually created to recognize his creator, so God fashioned him accordingly with the ability to reason and ponder over the creations and understand with perfect insight the existence of the creator of the universe. Man has been endowed with spiritual senses and faculties to compensate for any deficiencies and imperfections in rationality, to gain complete cognition of Almighty God, which rationality on its own cannot do. Rational observation may lead a person to conclude that the universe ought to have a creator, but cannot positively affirm that he really does exist. <clears throat> Therefore, for the seeker of truth about Almighty God, man needed to be and was granted some spiritual faculties to enable him or her to gain cognition of the Creator. So the benevolent Creator endowed mankind with first rational faculties in the brain and second spiritual faculties in the heart which depend on the purity of that heart. Spiritual faculties can reach that which cannot be discovered merely by rational faculties. So I quote from pages 13 to 14 in this regard. Quote, Most human beings should occasionally see true dreams or receive revelations so that they should be aware that there is a path open for their progress. But their dreams and revelations do not have any signs of God's acceptance, love and grace nor are such people free from the impurities of their egos. They are shown these dreams only so that an argument for believing in God's holy prophets is established against them. For if they were totally devoid of understanding the reality of true dreams and true revelations, and they had no definite knowledge of them, they could plead before God Almighty that they could not possibly understand the reality of prophethood, since they were completely unacquainted, unacquainted with this phenomenon. They could say that they were totally unaware of the essence of prophethood, and their nature was not given any example to understand it. Irrespective of being good or bad, being righteous or disobedient, being a follower of a true faith or a false one, are also shown some true dreams or vouchsafed revelations so that their concept and conjecture, which derives from hearsay and imitation of others, may reach the, le the level of ilmul yaqeen, which means knowledge by inference. End of quote. <clears throat> At this point... Those who experience Vahi experience one of two types of Vahi, explains the Promised Messiah. These are number one, Vahiyul Ibtala, which means the revelation of trial, and Vahiyul Istifa, which means the revelation of exaltation. The revelation of trial can sometimes bring about a person's ruin, as it did for Balam Baur, the one who receives the revelation of exaltation, on the other hand, is never ruined. Note that even the revelation of trial is not experienced by everyone, as a very small number 
can lack spiritual faculties altogether. So such people really have to rely upon the guidance of others. However, they cannot totally deny such real occurrences in others. Whereas those who rely only on such faculties in people of the past and none in the present time would lose the argument as there is no reason why such faculties should have become extinct. This proves that far from truth are those religions that say physical and intellectual faculties of humans are still the same as before, but deny that spiritual faculties are still present in humans. Note the mere fact a person sees true dreams or even experiences a few revelations does not prove any excellence on his or her part. It is merely his or her peculiar constitution of the brain, not depending on his or her virtue or truthfulness, nor does she or he or she have to be a believer or even a Muslim. Now I quote an extract from page 17 of the English translation to explain this further. The dreams and revelations experienced by people of this rank are steeped in much darkness and very rarely contain the brilliance of truth. They are not accompanied by any signs of God's love and acceptance. Any news of the unseen they may contain is such that it is also shared by tens of millions of others. Anyone can verify for himself such dreams and revelations are experienced by all kinds of people, including sinners, liars, infidels, atheists, and indeed even prostitutes. <clears throat> and gravely deceived is the one who deludes himself into believing that he is someone special, merely by experiencing in himself a sample of dreams and revelations of this quality. Such people derive no share of God's special blessings and bounties, nor does any acceptance develop in them. They have no connection with God at all. Since they do not develop a real friendship with God, their lack of nearness to Him allows Satan to remain their constant companion. Their dreams and revelations have a great deal of satanic influence. End of quote. Now this actually brings to an end my explanation of the introduction and subchapter one of the book, which deals with persons who occasionally experience true dreams or revelations, but who do not have any kind of relationship with God himself. Now I move on to subchapter 2, which deals with persons who occasionally see true dreams or have true revelations and who do have some relationship with God, although not necessarily of a high degree, and their carnal self is not totally obliterated by divine love, although it does get somewhat close to it. These are the people who adopt a measure of piety and chastity and make efforts for self-reformation. Thereby, they have a limited measure of illumination by true dreams and genuine visions, but they are not totally free from darkness. Some of their prayers are accepted, but not for extraordinary matters, as their piety is not so perfect. Since their self-purification is incomplete and there are other weaknesses by which they stumble when facing a trial, such a person, I quote from page 21, quote, 
he does not become an heir of the messengers and prophets and some of his inner impurities remain hidden within him. The relationship he has with God is not free from turbidity and deficiency for he beholds God Almighty from afar with his hazy sight but he is not in his lap. End of quote. Such a person, according to the Promised Messiah, is in a perilous state on account of his imperfect cognition of the Almighty God. Now compared with people in sub-chapter 1, the person in this category is somewhat safer from satanic intrusion and egoistic influences in his dreams and revelations. But this person does have a share of Satan in his nature and is not totally free of satanic inspirations. His carnal passions still cling to him, so he cannot be totally free of egoistic inspirations either. The Promised Messiah then concludes sub-chapter 2 by saying, those, quote, those who still have some impurities in their souls have impurities in their inspirations and revelations as well. End of quote. Now this is the end of the introduction and sub-chapters 1 and 2 types of persons of categories or ranks 1 and 2. Next, I resume with sub-chapter 3. Sub-chapter 3 is about people who receive revelations from God in the most perfect and clearest manner and have the honour of converse and discourse in a perfect manner. Their dreams are also true and they have the most perfect and complete relationship with God. They are in the fire of divine love and their carnal self is totally consumed by its flames. Such people are completely lost in his love. They get closer to God every day until their entire self is cast into the fire of divine love. Their carnal self is reduced to ashes by the divine light and the fire takes its place. How can you recognize such a person? <clears throat> the attributes of the divine are manifested in him or her. Like when a bar of iron is put into fire, the fire overpowers it completely, such that the bar begins to look like the fire itself. But it cannot be said that it is the fire itself. Likewise, the person who is overcome by the fire of divine love manifests divine glory, but he or she cannot be said to be God, just as the bar of iron cannot be said to be the fire. After the divine love has completely dominated the person, thousands of signs of consummate love appear, not just a single sign. Such a person dominates over all his enemies and, and adversaries. See Holy Quran Chapter 58, verse 22. One of his signs is that the benevolent God causes his own eloquent and pleasant word to flow from his tongue, his or her tongue. It is accompanied by a divine radiance, free from impurities. Sometimes, the words consist of a grand prophecy, unparalleled in quantity and quality, and often filled 
with divine awe and majesty and are full of divine support and help. So I quote from page 25, quote, Such matters are disclosed to him as are not disclosed to others, are open to prophecies. God's word descends upon him in the same manner as it depends sorry, as it descends upon God's holy prophets and messengers, and it is unequivocal and free from conjecture. End of quote. The tongue of such a person is blessed so much that the words flowing from it are unmatched by anyone in every sense. His eyes are given visionary powers, enabling him to see most hidden matters. He often meets the dead like the living. He can hear the voice of angels and benefits from them in times of anguish. Amazingly, even the voices of minerals, plants and animals sometimes reach him, just as the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When a tree trunk known as Hanana expressed its sorrow when the Holy Prophet وسلم, stopped leaning against it. Likewise, his nose is given the capability to smell fragrances from the unseen, like smell glad tidings or the abominable. His heart is granted sagacity. At the same time, Satan is made incapable of influencing him, as no part of Satan remains within him. His tongue is the tongue of God at all times. Even when he receives no specific revelation, whatever comes from his tongue is from God, as his carnal self is totally consumed. His forehead is granted a nur, or light, which no one but lovers of God possess. And this can even be perceived by non-believers. God bestows blessings upon their homes, which thus become safe from all calamities, being guarded by angels of God. Often the desires of people in this rank assume the colour of prophecies, making the desires a reality. Their pleasure and wrath becomes God's pleasure and wrath. It is because these people have annihilated their own selves and their will often co- coincides with the will of God. Their intense Focus and anguished heart means God hears them and does not reject their supplication. However, on a few occasions, to prove their servitude to God, their prayer is not granted, so the ignorant might not consider them to be partners with God himself. In particular, when God has manifested his will regarding a chastisement, he does not revoke his will. Please note that most of the prayers of God's elect are granted. This is their greatest miracle. Especially when God's chosen ones are tormented, then the signs of God appear. He shows extraordinary signs for those who love him with all their hearts and souls. As God is hidden, so are the people who manifest him. Even then, not every prayer of theirs is accepted, as God is like a friend to them, accepting some requests but needing them to submit to his will at other times. Some people may now ask that since other people also share in aspects of revelations, 
as those in rank three, so what is the distinction between them? The promised Messiah says that the difference between the chosen and non-chosen ones is tremendous. So I quote from page 29. Quote, The chosen people of God, who are suffused with divine light and whose inner selves are consumed by the fire of love, remain dominant over others in every excellence, both qualitatively and quantitatively. The signs of divine help and support appear in their favour in such an extraordinary manner and with such abundance that no one in the world can dare to produce their like. For, as I have already mentioned, these people are the perfect manifestation to show the face of God who is concealed. They show the hidden God to the world and God shows them. End of quote. Then, the promised Messiah, al-Islam, explains the three types of people considered so far in a different way. He says there are three types of people partaking in the heavenly signs. First, those who possess no merit, having no relationship with God whatsoever. However, because of their mental compatibility, they do see some true dreams and visions, which do not show any signs of the acceptance or endearment by God, nor do they derive any benefit from them. Thousands of wicked, evil, sinful and immoral ones share in such unpleasant dreams and revelation. Despite such dreams and visions, their conduct is not praiseworthy. Their faith is weak in many ways. They perpetuate every mean act and have many despicable traits in them. The quality of their dreams can be described like the experience of the person who perceives only smoke from a distance but does not see the light of the fire or feel its warmth. With no relationship to God, they only have a cursory, superficial experience. Second, are those persons who see dreams or experience revelations and have some kind of relationship with God which is not perfect. The quality of their dream or revelation is like the person who sees the light from a fire far away on a cold night. That light allows him some benefit to avoid some pitfalls on the route to the fire, but it cannot save him from the cold and destruction. If he fails to reach the warm fire, he is ruined. Third is the category of persons who experience revelations and dreams of a high quality. They are, and I quote from page 31, they, quote, they embrace every pain in the path of God. For the sake of God, by becoming the enemy of their ego and marching against it, they exhibit such power of faith that even the angels are amazed at their strength of faith. They are spiritual champions. And all of Satan's assaults amount to nothing in opposition to their spiritual strength. They are true in their faithfulness and uncompromising in their truthfulness, such that the sights of worldly pleasure cannot beguile them nor can the love of children or the bond of matrimony turn them away from their true beloved. In short, no bitterness can frighten them, nor can any carnal pleasure hinder them from God, nor can any relationship interfere 
in their relationship with God, end of quote. Their experience is like that of a person who on a cold, dark night reaches the full radiance of the fire and enters close to it and is safeguarded from the ill effects of the cold. The ra- this rank is attained by those who burn the cloak of carnal passions in the fire of divine love and adopt a tough life for God's sake. They choose even death and every pain for the sake of God. No bitterness can frighten them, nor can any carnal pleasure hinder them from God, nor can any worldly matter interfere in their relationship with God. Prophet Muhammad also lists these three ranks just described as follows. First, first rank, ilmul yaqeen, meaning knowledge by inference. Second, rank two, anul yaqeen, meaning certainty by sight. And rank three, haqqul yaqeen, meaning true certainty. The cognition or knowledge of God Almighty cannot be perfected or washed clean of all impurities until it reaches the third stage or rank of Hakkul Yaqeen. Promised Messiah Islam also says that a person of the third rank figuratively becomes endowed with divine attributes and is described on page 32 as follows. Quote, When revelation descends upon a soul that has attained purification, having been cleansed of all impurities, its luster is manifest to an extraordinary degree. The reflection of divine attributes upon that soul becomes complete, and the countenance of the one true God is fully revealed. End of quote. In addition, Promised Messiah explains that only those souls can accept the light of divine revelation in its perfect and best quality, which attain complete and perfect purification, and that mere receipt of revelations and dreams does not indicate any merit or excellence on the part of the receiver. And so long as his soul does not have the required quality, then the countenance of God is not reflected in those dreams or revelations. The reason why even less purified persons receive dreams or revelations is because just as God has given nearly everyone the physical senses, so likewise he has endowed most persons with faculties to receive spiritual light as well. This is for people of all ages and nations. This is where I come to an end for the first lecture. I shall commence next time uh, with subsection 4 of the book.